This week's episode of Still Untitled is brought to you by Rackspace. Did you know that Rackspace can help guide your migration to Amazon Web Services? Rackspace support for AWS offers tooling and automation for account management, security, and best practices. Learn more at rackspace.com slash your cloud. Now on with the show. Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I am Will. I am Adam. And I'm Norm. Oh, Did you have con- to think about that contraction. for a second? No, no. I was actually just debating whether or not to use a contraction or say I am. Mm. I, I, I was already through the point of ma- just making that decision before I realized I had not contracted. So Apologies for the late podcast this week. We're recording. Uh, we decided to wait till 420 to record the podcast. For some <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Dude. This is something in the air when I was walking down the street in the mission today. That's every day in the mission. That's true. No, it it's turns just, out it's a robot. Yeah, that, that food robot. The food robot that you've been seeing pictures of online, and if you didn't know, those pictures were taken just a few blocks from here. Yeah. Um, also, um, there I see them pop up in, there's two, because there's another one that pops up in the dog patch sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yes, right. Which, you got to um, paint a word picture, because uh, Yelp has partnered with a robotics company named Marble, and they have a... A delivery robot, autonomous delivery robot with a chaperone, I mm-hmm. guess. Uh, but the robot... Semi-autonomous, I think. That really is. looks like a, like an ice cream cart. It does look... It's precise. In fact, an ice cream cart. Yeah. So one broke down outside of the shop here, and uh, oh, I, I went out to taunt them and say hi, and um, an ice cream cart came by at the same time. Oh, that's perfect. And they were it about was, the same size. There was, a, there was like the guy pushing the ice cream cart looked at it and was like, Shook his head. Wow, that's just, like a scene out of uh, <laughs> what dystopian, choose your dystopian future well, movie, exactly. uh, Looper or something. It's like a curb your, I mean, it's a curb your enthusiasm moment, but also, for the yeah. robot. Right. 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 The robots <laughs> fail. You know what your robot needs? Your robot needs a handle. <laughs> Zoom in on that's the robot. That's my Larry Keep, David. Oh. That's pretty, pretty yeah, good Larry David. David. <laughs> um, I don't know why you don't have a handle on there. Oh. And now I sound like the anteater from Pink, Pink, uh, Pink Panther. The Jackie Mason anti. I'm an anteater. I eat ants. This is before this your is one time. of my gaps. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I know. It's not often I feel so much older. But so that, today so that it's was happening. that was well. I mean, you know, the, the gap between us, you and I have, and Norm and I have the same gap. Right. So, like, Norm is a double me away from you. Well, I could have called this podcast <laughs> the three gaps. That's well. There's only two decades gaps, apart. So three of, yeah, <laughs> decades apart. Anyway, um, yeah. So, Pink Panther was always one of those things that came on on Saturday morning after the cartoons that I would just turn to another oh, channel. It was, it was it's a surrealist masterpiece. The Pink Panther cartoons are fantastic. It didn't fly for eight year old Northeast Tennessee oh. Will. He would like pull a picture off the wall, throw it on the floor. It would be a trap door, and he'd run down some stairs. That kind of thing. I I need this is. So this is one of those things where like your parents influence when you're in the age where your parents influence still shapes you. Yeah. I, I was not mentally prepared for surrealism when I was not probably college age. Understood. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think probably you growing up with a, with somebody who was a, uh, an illustrator. Oh no, yeah. Magritte a, was my, yeah. Magritte was the first painter I knew by name. Yeah. So I was deeply inculcated with the surrealists. We listened to a lot of, um, of, uh, 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 uh the, who, who sang Kingston trio. Oh, wow. I thought you were going to say the Carpenters. You, yeah. You hippies. Yeah. <laughs> we were listening to Pete Seeger. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So cool. Legitimately hippies. I met Pete Seeger when I was a kid. Wow. Because the Hudson River Clearwater Festival, mm-hmm. uh, which Pete Seeger was a champion of, happened every year just a few miles north of where I grew up. And so we went there. We saw, oh my gosh. Um, God, not Crystal Gale. But another singer, I'll remember it sometime during this singer? podcast. Yeah, Loretta, um, Lynn or Loretta Lynn's sister. Is oh. that Crystal Gale? I think that's Crystal Gale. I think that is sure. Crystal Gale um, singing the green rolling hills of West Virginia. Oh, man. Which is where my dad grew up. So, like, it's one of the few times I saw my dad, saw, saw my daddy cry. Oh. And then we were walking and we passed Pete Seeger in his captain's hat. And my dad said, hi, Pete. And Pete looked at him, and my dad was also wearing a captain's hat because I was kind of, he was a hat guy. Yeah. Hence me being a hat it turns guy. Turns out. And Pete looked at my dad and said, Hey, Captain. And I was like, I couldn't believe that Pete Seeger spoke to my dad. That was awesome. He knew his name. <laughs> Good old Captain Savage. Decades apart. <laughs> oh, yeah. Norm, Norm. Norm. So you, ha- you have to know who Crystal Gale is. You have yeah, to know who Norm. Loretta Lynn is because uh. she did an album with Jack White. 
Okay, okay. That's in your wheelhouse. Right, 10 years ago. Yeah. So so Pete Seeger was, uh, an, is an American folk singer and an icon uh, of the stripe of Woody Guthrie, mm-hmm. and that important, where Woody Guthrie's early part of the century, stumping for minors and unionization uh, in, a, in the early part of the 20th century. Pete Seeger is definitely the mid-century, uh, famous for touring with a group called The Weavers, and singing and writing beautiful protest songs, uh, was right there with Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Um, part of the Hollywood blacklist, mm. absolutely was blackballed out of the entertainment industry for decades because of his communist leanings. Um, I don't even think they were leanings. I think he was right in the middle. I think he was probably a yeah. communist. Yeah. <laughs> At least socialist. Yeah. Um, and uh, just a super important part of of my culture growing up in the late sixties, early seventies, like albums like Peter Paul and Mary, mm-hmm. um, and those kind of Kingston Trio. I saw Peter Paul and Mary play at Wolf Trap once. What? Yeah, wow. like one of their last shows. <sighs> um, that was incredible. Like it was. I, I kind of went into that as a my my grandmother took me. Nice. Yeah. And when I was in high school, when I was like a freshman in high school and I was like, this is incredible. These guys like they're singing songs that mean things. It's not just the <laughs> 80s pop pablum that I grew up with. Yeah, exactly. There's no rock me Amadeus here. <laughs> guys, we're bearing the lead here. Because yeah. The, the generation unifying thing of this week is the new Star Wars trailer. Oh, yes. Yes. The Last Jedi. The Last Jedi. There's a trailer. Teaser. I didn't know that they, something happened. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it might, I, I will tell you. I enjoyed watching it, Mm -hmm. but the degree to which it teased and delivered nothing. That's what I wanted a teaser, Of course, that's exactly what I want, and Mm -hmm. I was happy about that, and I think that might be the last trailer I watch. That's definitely the last trailer I'm watching. And I think they succeeded. So there's a lot of debate right now. So it was unveiled at Star Wars Celebration, which we unfortunately were not at this year. Uh, Orlando, bring it back to Anaheim. That makes it much easier for us when it's in Anaheim. (laughs) sure that's what their primary (laughs) concern is. Can we get Norm there? (laughs) And Adam. Uh, But uh, they unveiled this trailer, two-minute trailer teaser. you got to call it a teaser. But unlike The Force Awakens first teaser where we saw all the new characters for the first time and the Falcon finally flying after you know decades uh, and BB-8 and all these new characters. This was just letting you know the story's continuing mm-hmm. and a gentle reminder, here are the breadcrumbs that for the main course come right? December. You know that the, the trailer opens as you are sure the movie does with the training sequence between Luke and Rey. You don't know what Luke means at the end of the trailer when he says the Jedi must go, the must go, the end. Last, end. Yeah. Jedi must end. Whether he means that that means that they've finally brought peace to the universe or somehow he is turned to the dark side, we don't know. I think it's enough for there to be some fun speculation and we are in the camp where we think the speculation of this kind is fun, uh, but but not so much that I don't think we can be spoiled. And you're right. I think it succeeds in getting us ready for the film yeah. without giving us too much. Totally. Well, and, I, you know, I stopped watching the Rogue One trailers after the second after the second one. But the one that showed the AT-ATs or the, whatever the, mm-hmm. the transport AT-ATs are, I was like, okay, I, I'm – look, in reality – this this movie does not need a trailer to convince me that I should go see it. What? Right? You're, you're not like, their target audience. Like I None am, of us are. I think no, I no. think if you are aware that there is a new Star are. Wars, right? I mean, they did they live streamed yes. and debuted at Celebration. Yeah. Um, and it needs to be for everyone. But but, need but to serve all the purposes. But the point of this trail, the trailers for these Star Wars movies, aren't to let people know, hey, there's a Star Wars movie coming out. That's probably taken care of now, right? right? Or that's a smaller percentage of their of their yeah. ultimate goal. I, I I also watched this week the honest trailer of mm. Rogue One. Oh, was that just, the one with the split of the Force Awakens and the? Oh no 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 no! no, 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 no. no this yeah, is yeah. honest trailers. Got so it. they're they they say things like featuring a band a cast of people who let's how do we say this. Just don't get too attached to them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they do great voiceovers and oh, yeah, the so good. Are and so good. featuring none of the shots from this trailer. Right. And actually, when you oh, yeah. see all the shots from the trailer that aren't in the movie lined up, you know, none I, of the stories about why why things are so different have really told the story. And I I, I look forward to some extra material someday on some DVD that show I, us. I hope that somebody will like, uh, like release the deathbed. Here's the making of story. <laughs> right. Like I, who, who I, I just want to know who knows um, the, the trailer of form factor, the 90 second now t- uh, two and a half minute trailer is just a piece of anthropology mm-hmm. in the history the chronology of filmmaking. Yeah. A part of the marketing process, the production process, uh, Rogue One, especially part of the production process. It is an artifact of that film being mm-hmm. made. 
and, and so there's a there's a and there's also now a full culture that grows up each time a trailer comes out. Gizmodo and other sites, IO9, start doing articles about like here's all the things we know. P- we we it put it together. And... They build flow charts and they start looking at plot lines. And I'm never interested in that kind of discussion. So I, because I. It just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't enhance my movie making. Uh, movie going. Well, that, that's so. That's where I ended up. Joey did this years before any of us yeah, even considered, and he's. This is why he's smarter than all of us. <laughs> but but when I went into Rogue One cold, I went into um, I went into uh, Rival completely cold. Yeah. Like I, every time I go into one of these big science fiction movies, Get Out, I went in completely cold. Right. You. The result is that I have the pure experience. It's what the filmmaker intended, not what the marketing department wanted me to get excited about going to the movie for right, right. before the, the film came out. And like, this is a good example of a really well done trailer. There's no plot. There's no character development. There's really like the only thing that you get is that there's going to be a training montage, which you knew yeah. was going to happen anyway. Well, the training could be the whole film. Who knows? And I, I like the sizzle. I gotta say, I like like the exciting. I like the anticipation. I like the the water cooler talk, which we're doing right now. I like the deep dives, and it's even if you're not going to read those articles now, I like going back to the articles after the movie comes out. So what was the impact of the trailer? On the flip side, I will tell you, I can't stop watching the trailer for Wonder Woman. I haven't even seen it. Oh, so there's three. Yeah, and many sites are putting them all up in line, so you can watch them all together. Um, she, uh, uh, Gal Gadot mm-hmm. is Wonder Woman. Um, aside from being preternaturally beautiful as, as you'd expect them to cast, she seems amazing in the role. And from my friends at FBFX who worked on her costume, mm-hmm. she's totally a delight to work with. Um, on the, she's, they've now worked with her on three films. Uh, so there's, uh, Batman versus Superman, the Wonder Woman film, and now the oh, Justice, yeah. Justice League. Um, and say she's just wonderful to work with and the, the costumes are magnificent and I don't know how that movie's going to be. It could totally blow. So I feel like for Wonder Woman, I'm like, I'm enjoying the trailer so much. I'm just going to keep okay. watching them and enjoying a movie that well, might not be the one I end up seeing. I mean, in many cases, the trailer is the best part and like, uh, Ghost in the Shell, ma- Ghost in the Shell, Watchmen, they're masterful. Almost I, music I like video. Watchmen, Norm. Uh, I like Watchmen too, but I like, like the trailer is better than the film. Um, with the Trent Reznor? No, no, no. With uh, um, uh, Smashing Pumpkins. Yes, That's it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and there, there are just feats of editing. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes, even if the film ends up not being great, to have just that moment in time where you were excited about the movie for the trailer and that told the story, that glimpse of it is totally fine. I'm, okay, I'm happy so, to have that. So speaking of trailers that were way better than the movie, um, I watched a thing just this morning. Nerd writer's piece on. Uh, how passengers would be far more watchable if you watched it in a complete, if they cut it in a totally different order. So, uh, yeah, passengers oh, yeah. is. Uh, so, have you not seen this? I film? haven't seen it, but hold on, let me guess. You've yeah, seen, the, you seen, the film. I've seen the film. Okay, so then I'd love, and, and you, I'd love to. Well, okay, you, we we have to enter spoiler cast okay. territory, right. territory which you, like this is not a real want... big warning because I don't think people are out there waiting to watch Passengers and then <laughs> no, listen to this podcast. No. I don't think they ever wanted a Passengers if, spoiler cast, if you, but we're going to get it. No, and if you were waiting for Passengers, really don't. Well, so uh, hold on. I was. The visual, like I read this, this is a script that I read years ago because John Spates has done, he wrote Doctor Strange last I year. It's a read really this. good you, script. You read the script that Keanu yeah. Reeves had been developing for 10 years. Yeah. I want to read that. Yeah, I have a, Okay, yeah. I'd, I'd really like to read so, that. So, and John Spates also was one of the first writers on Prometheus. Uh, yeah. And this is a script to give you some sense, the con- context of why Hollywood, when you talk to a lot of people who are filmmakers, they say this, everyone says the script was so good. The script was so good. The reason they're saying that is that Passengers, the script that John Spates wrote, this is almost a, a decade ago now, um, was on the blacklist right. as the blacklist was being right. formed. Was, and, and this is the uh, the, the list, famous, famous, famous yearly compendium uh, of uh, unproduced yes, genius scripts, which yeah. now has become a famous. I mean, Little Miss Sunshine came out of this. Uh, Social Network came out of it. Mm-hmm. But this is back in 2006 and seven when Passengers was on the top of the blacklist. It was a film that Hollywood deemed could not be made because it was too expensive. The script. Uh, sometimes as great of a story as it could be, it was too expensive to make. Right. They do the cost benefit analysis. And so people in Hollywood had been championing this film from when Keanu Reeves and developing it to finally they Sony got the money to make it with Chris Pratt, 
Jennifer Lawrence, which and necess- spent the money. Which necessitated, apparently, a certain type radical of film. changes to the script. And it's not radical it's changes. Not radical. It's oh, radical okay. direction. Yeah. And they had to present it and market it and edit it in a certain way because of those actors. Okay, so what was the original direction the script went in? Okay. So let's let's let's, let's yeah. talk about the movie shows first. Okay, the, the basic premise of the movie. Okay, yeah. it's a it's a, it's, <laughs> it's, it's Titanic it's, it's meets worst, Guardians of the Galaxy. But it's but it's worst stalker. No, it's 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 single well, white on. female. Hold on. Even <laughs> even but, before no, that, the, that, the basic story is it's a hard science fiction story of yeah. what a man's exploration into a colonization of a different world. Well, right? that, a generation that, ship. That's that's the background. It, right, the background. The, the background setting. is yeah. yes, the, a, a ship of people in hypersleep are heading on a hundred and twenty journey, hundred hundred and twenty your journey to a new earth right, right. and uh chris pratt plays and a it's a luxury uh, cruise ship version of the traveling to but a with but with all of the things that a that a yeah. old ocean old style yeah. ocean liner yeah. Yeah, there's multiple classes of passengers there's a whole different there's a whole thing going on julie's doing shuffleboard on the lido deck etc right. yep exactly um and he wakes up because of some accident wakes up from cryo sleep and he can't get back into cryo sleep so he's gonna end up dying on the ship it's a and malfunction malfunction he has and 90 then, years on the voyage to go right, when he wakes up and he's he's like 30 something years old he's gonna die so the the conflict comes in and that he decides to wake up a fellow passenger. He decides not to kill himself. Yes. And then at the most dark moment of his soul, he becomes infatuated with another sleeping passenger who happens to be Jennifer Lawrence. Lawrence. A really yep. attractive blonde woman. And he can see her <laughs> and he becomes a very sleeping her. beauty type scenario where he then decides, to, decides, makes the decision to wake her up and, and pretend that she's been woken up under the same conditions yeah. he has. Yes. And then they fall in love or she falls in love with him by his design. And then when she finds out that he woke her up, thereby sentencing her to death on the ship, that's where the central conflict comes in. And it's really Groundhog Day meets Titanic <laughs> if you want to get down to it. At the end, the movie at the end. So That's awesome. At the end... Uh, he they, redeems himself he, because they saved the ship. The ship was going to end up being destroyed anyway. Like his, the malfunction that woke his pod up would have killed everyone on the ship all, anyway. And together they save Eventually. the ship and she decides in the film to not go back to cryosleep because only one of them can. They have this magic MacGuffin space pod <laughs> and she decides to stay with him. And the moral of the story is that their love conquers all, which was not well received. No. And poorly- Because it's- Fucking, excuse it's me for up. cursing, but it's yeah. fucking creepy. Yeah. It is. And the, the sense that conflict of the film of how do you, one, do you redeem the yeah, character Chris Pratt yeah, plays? Yeah, right. and, and two, if you choose, if the director and the storyteller chooses to make redemption part of the story, can that even be achieved? Right. I think the film shows Will it the, no. Uh, right. And so I, well, tried, I tried to watch this recently. Yeah. Uh, in a hotel. It was somewhere. And I... I only got up to the moment at which he decided to wake her up, and I was like, "I can't watch anymore." Well, so it so, made me so well, upset. But so there's 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 two things that they were clearly they clearly knew this was going to be a problem, right? Because yeah. they make the final conflict require both of them working separately to get you know yeah. uh, to mm-hmm. Chris same purposes. Chris Pratt has to risk his life to to yeah. to do the part that he has to do, right? And then she comes out and saves him at the end because like her his choice when he wakes her up is madness versus. Versus wake, waking her up and right. killing her, essentially. Yeah. And her choice at the end is madness versus waking him up and, right. and you know, and doing the whole, the whole thing again. <laughs> so, th- so like, I there's mirror image choices. I can see why they that they'd potentially solved oh the problem God. in their script. And I know that, to the filmmaker's credit, they tried to tackle this as earnestly as they could I, with the confines of still trying to sell it as a romance story. I totally and that agree was with the that. Problem. And it yeah. is, it's also... It's also a beautiful movie. Oh, it's it like looks they cut the great. Money. The set, the money is on the screen. Their performances are terrific. It's just the plot that drives me. So crazy. here's the thing. Yeah, oh. in the in the script, sorry, Norm. In the script, they they do a really good job illustrating that the that the character played by Chris Pratt is full on completely has completely lost his mind and has descended into madness. Right, ah. and in the movie. You get that he's on the edge of that, but you get you don't right, get that he is mad. You just, get that just he because is, he's put on a big fake beard, a p- pretty bad beard, was, by the way. Yeah. Um, and, was, <laughs> and and there is a sequence where he like looks in the mirror and he says, "Don't do this." As he's shaving his beard, so he's already made up his mind. He's going to do it, but he says, "Don't do this. Don't wake her up." And he's shaving, and that's like a nice mm-hmm. like 
thriller, psychological thriller moment. But in the script, it's he's totally in, off the. In the deep script, end. you get yeah. like from his conversations with the bartender, from the things that he's doing around the ship, right? Like, like so he's you, he's you like get, smearing his own poo on the wall. It's kinda. not quite that bad, but like, <laughs> but like the scene specifically, the scene where he's working on the outside of the door. And like he's that was the most that was really amazing to me because that's precisely what I would be doing. Yeah. Well, there's a working the problem. Right. I think, yeah. I think what John Splates wanted to do, he said this before, is put a put you in the mind of what would you do. Right. And put a normal person in a fantastical scenario and let it unravel. Mm-hmm. Um, and the director, they just however they edited, it, they just didn't earn that. No. Um, to, to, to me, it was it was that he showed he showed that he was he was really worried about what was going to happen to him versus what was happening to him. And you could like in the script, they illustrated that with the, with the progression of his violence against that door. Right. 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 His conversations with the bartender and in, and which in and, the film, they like ham, they just yeah. said here, it's the yeah. shining. Look at the carpet. Yeah. It's the right. sh- carpet from the shining. It looks just like the shining. Well, that's Chris, not enough. And Chris Pratt played it a little bit too goofy and a little bit, not enough mad, which may, you know, who knows whether that's him or direction or whatever, but, but that was the takeaway. And I think if you had felt, if you had believed, that his descent into madness was c- complete and we were in like a heart of darkness situation. Listen, I still don't think it's redeemable. I, I, I don't I think I, the I, shot of him, but the shot of him outside the door, when you saw how much equipment he'd brought to try and get into the yeah. bridge, that made me deeply sad. And I really felt for that character. Yeah. Of like, yeah, screw it. I am going to try every last thing and all the tools laid out there. The mess. I mean, I've like was brilliantly laid out and that the, was the one time I felt real and that was the a show with the takeout tell, food right yes right. that was a, and then they instead <clears throat> yeah. told they had the Lawrence Fishburne character say tell the audience a drowning man you know drags everyone down a sinking man dr- drowns you know he was drowning like I don't need that told to me show it in more cases yeah so the nerd writer video that Adam's referring <laughs> to love this. um posits that the film could <laughs> potentially be okay. salvage with a re-edit can I guess you can, ed- you can okay guess. yeah I guess that they cut out the reveal about him waking her up they keep that mysterious and put that at the very end when she has a flip out after the ship is already damaged and um and goes through the whole thing opposite no it's really in open. fact in fact wait 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 yeah. um what they talk about is the problem with the film is that you're 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 Chris Pratt he's right. your protagonist and because he's his behavior is so questionable you're oh. you're complicit this is the problem with the with the with him waking her up it's, you're complicit because that's your main character right and so what they did what they posit is she's your protagonist open the film with her waking up as if the whole way the progression happened with him waking up and not being sure what's going on, do that with her instead. So open up 30 minutes into Got the film it. as she's waking up. And now his motivations seem really creepy and weird. You don't know if he's a good guy or a so bad guy. So then it's guy. a thriller rather than a romance. Yeah, exactly. That's, and, and that's how he had it. And, wow. and I think it does work that way, but I disagree. I disagree. <laughs> I, I think I think that is a fair way to edit what's already been done, but I think it betrays the intent of the film, which is... It wasn't intended. It wasn't intended to be a thriller and a horror. And if you wanted to make a thrill and a horror, yes, you could make it that way. But I would rather try to save the film and make it more thought provoking, with the intent that John Splates had in the film. Like, and there are a couple a couple of ways that I think, as I watched this yeah. film, that I would have either changed or ended it. And people have thrown these suggestions out. Also, one I think it would have been cool to have a reveal to show Wake from her perspective as well, but reveal that he woke up not one year ago, but like. 20 years or, ago or eight years like right, a right, really right. like and but, so he has yeah. the mind of a, a child and been alone and it's really the deep that's end. cool that's messed up and i mean and th- that that takes me a long way towards understanding but then i would imagine that and two then, then yeah. it has the danger of that is that it ends up being like a like a like a uh, uh florence nightingale situation where right. she has to bring him back to humanity <laughs> right, right but that's but that, which is also creepy but for but is maybe a little bit more excusable i don't know and the relationship yeah, I don't know. is different I don't know then the relationship isn't yeah. maybe the lover the creeper lover relationship but it's maybe more of a uh she's taking care of him and and frankly i also have a problem with this because she's so young yeah. I mean, she's a wonderful actress and I love her and she deserves her Oscar. But as a romantic lead, she's like, what, she's like 24? Like when I was that, reading that the just, script, it, it, in my mind, it was like Michelle Monaghan, someone like. It creeped well, me out. The, the like, youth like, yeah, like if, if they were, if it was Keanu Reeves and Michelle Moynihan, it would be a little bit different. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I agree. The other way that people have thought about how it could end, and I completely agree, is one way to end. So there's the MacGuffin pod, all right? Right. Uh, is not to let 
Chris Pratt live at all, not make it redeemable. Like, right. Give up on the fact that he could be redeemed and that you can make a, a, a love story out of it. Let them go through the motions and then let it put it on her to make the decision. Now, now then she gets to be the normal pers- person put in the fantastical scenario and let the film linger with she's l- l- alone in the ship. He died saving the ship. Well, that's right. your 70s science fiction. And ending, then right? does she go and look through the, the wave of uh, pods and wake someone else up right. a year later? Or does she have his baby? Well, so, so the other thing, <laughs> the other big difference in the script yeah. Yeah. is that the computer failures that doomed the ship that they eventually fixed also killed everyone in the pods. Oh, except so, them two. Except, except for those two. Oh, so and him waking her up saved, saved her, her life, life which, which I is, don't think doesn't redeem it's, either. Uh, but again, it's the same problem yeah. that the film has. But I'm, Will's, I'm the, really w- curious to. I, I would love. I I have never met Keanu Reeves, and I know some people who know him, and apparently he's a delightful, wonderful person. And mm-hmm. I would love to sit down, and maybe he wouldn't want to do it publicly, but pick his brain about what he saw in the script and why he wanted to make well, it. Th- I think Keanu so th- could do the desperation much better. I totally it, agree. It was a hard sci-fi. Like the, the the script as I read it was a really hard science fiction problem, right? right. What if you're alone on this 120 year journey? Journey. You're a third of the way through it, and you're gonna and you wake up, gonna and you're never gonna see another person. You're gonna die. And you had the Martian. The same thing of him trying to work the right. problem, going right. through all the different possible solutions, right? Which they touch on in the film. They should. They illustrate it, but it's but as we saw with the Martian, it was really hard to show that when you can't tell it. it yeah. um, but also, I think Will, you're talking about in the original script, everyone else dies. They're the last two on the ship, and the film ends with their sh- the uh, century ship, generation ship, landing in the new planet. Yeah. The doors open, and kids run out, and it's their great grandchildren and oh, their really? children. Oh, and is that you how go the film ends? And that's, yeah. No, that's how the, oh, the, the, the script, script ends. ends. Oh. And the, the camera tracks inside. Oh, right. So, so everyone else dies, but they but create they, new So humanity. you think it's going to be a twist ending, but the twist that you expect, that the ship lands and it's empty and it's a ghost ship, isn't the twist that they give you. And the camera is, goes in and you have the tree that he plants becomes their family tree, yeah, literally. And they are... They are the Adam and Eve of this show. The whole planet full of creepers. Oh, that's- Little creepers. <laughs> uh, sorry, inbred creepers. Well, I mean, well, presumably there's other people already on the planet. It's just like Seven Eves where you have uh, where you have like the eggs in storage and you, you know, you just got to <laughs> yeah. you know, use Harvest IVF. the skin cells oh, out yeah. of the busted, busted. Um, uh, yeah. Right, right, right. The We're going to have to scrape the fingernails of... Yeah. The, the other solution that I have, and I, I, this is one I'm most happy with. We've got to move on from this. I know, I know. Yeah, this okay. is my last thing. And okay. I, I, I think it's the best possible solution is... <laughs> The end of the film, she's given a choice to go back to sleep. Yeah. And she chooses not to. Yeah. Right? The, and this is the director and the writer's Stockholm way of Syndrome saying, is what that's called. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, yeah. now she has a choice. I would have been happier with her and him switching off and going to sleep one year at a time. That's a cop out, And though. they have one day with each other every, every, every year. And so by oh, the end of the film, you romantic. 90 years later, they are, married last year. They, they, <laughs> they are 90 years old. They get to see the landing of the ship yeah. and everyone wakes up and they are two old people because they've each have the time they needed, the 45 years. And they say, spend one day with each other. And um, then they both die holding hands. But they get to uh, see as, the planet. And she holds him up as he falls off of the board and sinks into the ocean on the new planet. And oh, then, gr- then I, I, I kind of dig that. I kind of uh, dig that. That's kind of nice. That's that's a total Deus Ex Machina, <laughs> totally technological MacGuffin. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think we have spent as much time as we ought to on passengers. Like, like <laughs> I, I, I just, I was so bummed out watching the movie because the script was so interesting and 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 yeah. and, and and challenging. Like yeah. it was hard. And it's a, it's so gorgeous. The ship is it's so gorgeous. Really gorgeous. Space suits totally. and like yeah. all the science, all the space. Like they even did the, they did the conservation momentum right with him. Like he's he's untethered, flying away into space, and the way he gets going in the direction he needs to go is by throwing something the yeah. direction he doesn't want to go. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. great. It's yeah, yeah. I, I oh, it's so frustrating. What uh, what else are we gonna cover oh in this? We, the science <laughs> march is happening yes. on Saturday. Oh my god! Just uh, two days from now. Two days uh, from Earth now. Day, April twenty second. Marchforscience dot com is the website you want to go to for information. It's happening. There are marches in four hundred and thirty cities all wow. over San Francisco and the world. I think it's yeah. actually many more than that now. Yeah. So um, probably am, one close to where you live. I am the keynote speaker in our hometown here of San Francisco. Ooh. Yes. Cool. Um, I'm gonna sing a a, 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 a Spice Girls song. No, I'm kidding. I'll actually tell you what you want, what I really, really want. <laughs> I want a zigga zigga ah. <laughs> well, I was going to this. I was going to the science march on Saturday, but eh. generations apart, decades apart. Um, 
Uh, anyway, yes, the science march is happening on Saturday. That's very exciting. We are also going to have a heavy presence tested and my cosplay passions at the Silicon Valley Comic Con. This is so Steve cool. Wozniak this weekend. This is so cool yeah. what you're doing. Really, really cool. So we have a room set up um, that's going to be Adam's Cosplay Cave and Lounge, some stuff from the cave here, some costumes, and we have some of our friends flying in to uh, run some workshops for foam fabrication and painting. Um, so if you're going to be in San Jose, go to Silicon Valley Comic Con, hang out. If you're a cosplayer, you can stop by and you can patch up your costume, hot glue, tape, rivets, whatever you Needles, need. Needles, thread, the whole Needles, thing. Needles, thread. We made the toolkit yesterday. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's really, you, really cool. You, this is one of the things that you talked about when we first went to Comic-Con with you in 2012. How much I love the fact that people run around being mobile repair stations yeah. and cons have repair stations. I wanted to do the same but thing. But that's, that's awesome. I'm so excited that it's finally happening. So it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful idea. And it's, you know, it's about also giving back to this amazing community that has given me so much and given us so much. It's uh, the, the egalitarianism and the, the the sharing of information, techniques, enthusiasm, inspiration. It's it's a thrilling and lovely community. That's awesome. Awesome. I, I think, th is anything else to tease on, on Tesla? Uh, we week? were at the Replica Prop Forum's annual showcase and party. Um, we save that, talk about that for another time, but the videos are on the site. It was great to see a lot of familiar faces, meet some new people, see their projects up close. Uh, wonderful k2so oh ah, so oh, really yeah, yeah. yeah. A, pu a full-size puppeted one yeah wow. yeah um, but th those videos are on the site um and on a budget on a wow. genuinely cool budget i um i popped into ken plumes a bit of a chat podcast this week yes i saw the i saw your avatar on his twitter feed yes we talked about virtual reality and the legend of zelda breath of the wild How, are you enjoying it that game is unbelievable really it is norm you've played it's yeah. it's um it, they built a world, they did the thing, you know, open world games have been around for a really long time. They, yeah. Those games work by taking it like different competing systems and kind of making them interact, making the player make them interact in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Nintendo did is brought that and added a level of polish to it that I've never seen before. You know, they, instead of gating your progression with a series of invisible walls and the kind of normal video game bullshit, they just they just give you a stamina meter and let you climb whatever you want. If you figure out a way around that, you can you can go to places you're not supposed to go. And wow! It's it's it is a mass. It is it is one of the most incredible video games I've ever played. Jo uh, Josh, my lighting guy on the tour, was playing it every every single it's, day. It, well, and the fact that it's on the Switch, so you can like just chuck it in your bag when you're on right. the train or whatever. Have ten minutes, you can load it up and go fishing. Um, I wanted to point out um, that I keep forgetting to mention this, but my mom listens to this podcast. Hi, Adam's mom. Hi, mom. I uh, she 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 sometimes complains that the microphone hides my pretty face, and she wants to see us. We've we've all seen enough of your yeah. pretty face. <laughs> Let's be real. I'm just saying about my mom. You know, she's my biggest fan. She's amazing. Uh, I'm going to see her in a few weeks. She's going to come out here to San Francisco, but oh, cool. I I know that she's listening. So I want to say, Mom, I love you. Hi, Mom. Hi. My mom doesn't listen to the podcast. <laughs> I hope. I don't know. She's never said it if she does. Well, when I talk to her. Yes. No, I'm kidding. Let her tell her I said hi. <laughs> say hello to my mother for me, Adam. We'll say see, hi to your yeah. mother for me. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week Thanks before if Marky listening. Mark doesn't come get us. <laughs> All right. Bye, Bye guys. guys. Bye. <laughs> that was awesome. Once again, I want to thank the sponsor of this week's episode of Still Entitled, and that is Rackspace. Rackspace support for Amazon Web Services offers tooling and automation for account management, security, and best practices. Control your costs and relax knowing Rackspace will monitor your AWS 24-7. Learn more at rackspace.com slash your cloud. We'll see you next week.